This is lecture four, patent document two, written description and best mode. For this lecture, there are two components. We're gonna continue our discussion uh, about enablement and written description, the basic disclosure requirements of Title 35. In particular, looking more closely at written description and then circling back to talk about how it interacts with the enablement requirement. And then we're going to discuss the best mode requirement, which is a requirement that has um, undergone a diminishment in importance uh, given some recent amendments to the law, but it nonetheless uh, remains quite relevant to the ways that people need to disclose their inventions for patentability purposes. So let's go to enablement versus written description. Uh, we started this on uh, in class four and discussing um, how 112 paragraph 1, 35 U.S.C. 112 paragraph 1 up there on the slide, um, has two components according to the Federal Circuit. It has both an enablement requirement um, and here what we're primarily going to be talking about today, a written description requirement. The written description requirement is, is shown here highlighted. Uh, the specification shall contain a written description of the invention. Um, the rest of the text there uh, is, is mostly the enablement requirement. So the first thing to think about, and, and we've discussed this a little bit already, is to, to consider how um, this might be different from the enablement requirement. Right? What is it about this language that suggests that it's a separate and independent requirement? Well, one, one reason is there's a comma there, right? That comma, that very first comma in the specification uh, in the 112 paragraph 1, um, the specification shall contain a written description of the invention, comma, and then goes on and says and. That comma and suggests, at least as a matter of statutory language, that um, the uh, two requirements, written description and enablement, are indeed separate. Um, the other sort of support, statutory support uh, for that is, is the, the idea that you have this enablement requirement that has specific sets of details and the written description requirement doesn't, um, which is also an argument against a separate and independent requirement. I mean, one argument uh, along the lines of statutory language might be that, you know, what that first clause is doing is simply is simply requiring that everybody have a written patent application, right? It could be that that there's no such thing as a independent written description requirement, as much as we are simply requiring people to, to write things down, and then what they have to do to, when they write them down is enable uh, the full scope of their invention. But be that as it may, the the answer the Federal Circuit is consistently given. Um, is that there is a separate and independent written description requirement. Now, as we discussed in class four, for many years it was widely uh, assumed, and, and uh, there were court cases supporting this, that the uh, uh, statutory um, differences between written description and enablement um, were such, uh, were small enough that as long as an application, as long as a patented invention passed the enablement requirement, it also passed the written description requirement. So there really wasn't, they sort of rose and fell together. Gentry Gallery, um, among others, was one, a set of case, among a set of cases that started to raise significant awareness among uh, the patent community that the court did indeed consider the written description requirement to be separate and not only separate, but uh, had an independent, the written description requirement that is, had an independent basis and independent rules. And the question then becomes, what are those rules? We saw in the Gentry Gallery case this idea the court presented that if you disclose in there, in that case, only one possibility for your invention and then you claim more broadly than that, that could violate the written description requirement. Um, but what does that mean and, and how far does that go? We also saw that in Ethicon, the Federal Circuit limited that to particular kinds of um, uh, patents where the patentee had expressly said there was no other way to, to achieve the invention. Um, what about uh, this idea that we've talked about before with respect to disclosure that you can, you can claim somewhat more broadly um, than what you actually disclose as long as people of ordinary skill in the art, a person of ordinary skill in the art, would be able to fill in some of those gaps. How does that apply uh, to the written description requirement, if at all? Right. So 
Um, the other question is, and, and we'll talk about this at the end uh, of our discussion, is to think about what is, what are we achieving with a separate and independent written description requirement. What we we talked um, in class four about why the disclosure requirements are are important to uh, on the the basic functioning of the patent system. What is it specific to um, the written description requirement that um, that is important uh, and and has an important policy basis? And there have been a few reasons thrown around, and I'll I'll let uh, throw them out here. Um, so one is it might prevent patentees from adding new matter to their patent applications after they file. Right? So one of the ironclad rules of patent law is that once you file your patent application, you can no longer add new matter uh, to that patent application. Well, you can, but then you lose your filing date, and you have to take a new filing date, and that obviously has some important consequences. So no new matter is an important requirement. Maybe the written description requirement by saying that whatever you've described is um, uh, is required uh, is whatever you describe is related to your claims. Maybe that enforces this bargain, and that's not a bad theory. Except Section 132 of the Patent Act actually expressly forbids the adding of new matter to patent applications. So even if at one time the written description requirement was needed to enforce that bargain, really doesn't make any sense now, right? The other way to think about this is that maybe this is a policy tool. Maybe written description is all about trying to make sure that, that inventors fully recognize uh, the true value of their inventions and prevent them from, in a sense, over-claiming, uh, prevent them from um, claiming more broadly than what they actually have thought about. And the, the written description requirement by saying that you have to fully describe your invention is a way of enforcing um, uh, upon inventors um, this uh, limitation on how broadly they can claim. And I think there might be something to that. Uh, I think that a lot of the cases that the Federal Circuit has dealt with the written description requirement on have that characteristic where the court senses that the inventor is in a sense over claiming. Um, on the other hand, that creates something of a trap for unwary patentees, right? Those patentees that are unable to be to creatively think about all the different ways that their invention might be used, uh, if they aren't able to claim more broadly without disclosing all of those various embodiments, um, then they're going to lose significant value potentially in their patents, and that's going to be problematic uh, potentially for the patent system. Now, you might argue that on balance we'd prefer people not be able to overclaim. Uh, and we will take some people getting caught in the trap as the trade-off, but in any event, we should probably be express about it, right? Um, and then finally, and the, the thing that the Federal Circuit most often points to as the reason for the written description requirement is that it's used to authenticate that the inventor was in possession, right? It, it, for the Federal Circuit, uh, it's all about possession of the invention at the time of the filing. Right, that it's it, the intent, as the court sees it, is to um, enforce upon the patentee uh, that they be uh, in possession of the invention. So the question there is, what do we mean by that? Right? I mean, if I've taught you how to make and use something, uh, haven't I? Don't I possess it in any sort of ordinary sense of the word possession? And the court seems to think that that's not actually true. That even if I can enable, even if I can allow you to make my invention, I have not necessarily um, uh, proved that I am in possession of it, that I understand it, that I have thought through it fully, uh, and therefore it might file, uh, fail the written description requirement. All right, so these are the various um, uh, possible options here uh, for why, why we would have it, and we'll come back to this and think about uh, which of these seems to make the most sense and whether overall having this separate and independent requirement is a good idea. So the first case uh, that I had you read today uh, was Ariad Pharmaceuticals, right? So Ariad is, is obviously a, a pharmaceutical um, uh, company, as is Eli Lilly, um, disputing about a particular um, uh, kind of technology, a gene expression, um, uh, the regulation of gene expression by the transcription factor uh, NKB. Right, NFKB. We'll we'll just say it that way. Um, and the claims here, and uh, although the the technology can be a little difficult to read at first, um, I'll try and boil it down 
for you here. The claims here were methods involving the reduction of the activity between NFKB recognition sites. All right, this, this is what was claimed. Um, and so this invention was intended to reduce this kind of activity and therefore um, uh, uh, cure, uh, it potentially cure diseases. Right? Um, uh, so the claims were not limited to any particular substance or molecule. Simply, um, the claims simply were to um, uh, the reduction of these activities um, by, uh, between the NFKB recognition sites. The disclosure of the patent hypothesizes three kinds of molecules that can do this. Right? These are activity-based molecules, decoy, uh, or sorry, uh, decoy molecules, dominantly interfering mo molecules, and a specific inhibitor type of molecule. The disclosure says any of these work, uh, and indeed seem to have some uh, data to back that up, but didn't specify exactly which one. It didn't specify what it was about these three kinds of things um, that were that would point you towards one of these um, uh, or the other. All right. So the first question to ask yourself is: Are these claims enabled? All right. Um, when it's interesting, one of the interesting things about the Eli Lilly case, the Ariad versus Eli Lilly case, is that the court didn't deal with enablement um, uh, in uh, in the en banc and even in the panel opinion. And in fact, um, the the question about would a person of ordinary skill in the art, given that disclosure, be able to select from among the various possibilities of molecules without undue experimentation is an interesting question that was actually never resolved by the court. Right? It should remind you of a case that we've read already uh, in this course, um, that being the, the um, uh, incandescent uh, uh, light uh, case where the, the question there was, has um, the inventor enabled a range of possible materials by only disclosing one and not allowing for not disclosing the common factor between um, the various materials that might work? And interestingly enough, in the panel opinion, um, Judge Lynn um, uh, specifically no calls this out and says, we have not specifically addressed enablement in relation to the type of claims at issue here, that is, claims written broadly enough to cover any method for achieving a particular result. It may be that such a claim can never be valid since the specification cannot enable unknown methods. Right? So it might be that this is uh, not enabled. Uh, and this is an important issue which we have left unresolved. It's an issue we would have been compelled to reach had the case been decided on enablement grounds, a basis found in Section 112, instead of on written description grounds, a separate basis not justified under that section or any other provision of the Patent Act. Right? So what, um, the question that, that I'd ask you now is, what is Judge Lynn getting at? I mean, what's what's his, his idea here? Um, and... Uh, so consider that as to whether, as you read the rest of Eli Lilly, and think about whether Judge Lynn is ultimately right, that, that the answer to the question might have been more easily resolved um, using enablement. So moving on, let's look at written description, right? So again, we have disclosure, we have claims. And the question is, does the disclosure provide uh, what the court describes as a written description of the claims, right? And so the court, for the first time, uh, actually tries to lay out a very specific uh, sort of test, right? So the test for sufficiency of the disclosure is whether the disclosure of the application reasonably conveys to those skilled in the art that the inventor had possession of the claim subject matter as of the filing date. So again, with the possession phrasing. The specification must describe an invention understandable to that skilled artisan and show that the inventor actually invented the invention claimed. Again, the idea here seems to be something about telling everyone that you, at the time of filing, understood this invention. You had it. Um, you, you actually invented it at that time. While the description requirement does not demand any particular form of disclosure or that the specification recite the claimed invention in hoc verba, a description that merely renders the invention obvious does not satisfy the requirement. Right? So this is the important part. The idea here that the court is getting at is you cannot leave gaps. Right? You cannot 
um, offer um, to the uh, expect that the person of ordinary skill in the art will fill in the gaps with respect to your written description disclosure. Um, you can you you have to disclose it. They say you don't have to disclose it in any particular way, and indeed you don't have to um, recite the claim invention in hoc verba, right? But merely making it obvious, merely making it possible for a person of ordinary skill in the art to to understand it is not enough. You have to do more, right? Um, and so this is um, uh, the sort of key uh, test language for written description. The term possession has never been very enlightening. It implies that as long as one can re produce records documenting a written description, one can show possession. But the hallmark of written description is disclosure. Thus, possession is shown in, shown in the disclosure as a more complete formulation. Yet, whatever the articulation, the test requires an objective inquiry into the four corners of the specification from the perspective of a person of ordinary skill in the art. Based on that inquiry, the specification must describe an invention understandable to that skilled artisan and show that the inventor actually invented the invention claimed. Okay, so that's the test. That is the way that the court has articulated um, the written description requirement uh, in Ariad, and that's the sort of most recent articulation of this. And the idea here is that you have to, it's what, what is sort of understood as the four corners approach. You look at the four corners of the specification. You need to find within the four corners of the specification some sort of description um, of the invention sufficient to convince a person of skill in the art uh, that the inventor actually invented. Um, so how do you comply with that? Well, you got to disclose, right? I mean, you got to disclose enough so that a person of skill in the art would recognize that you actually possess the invention, that you as the inventor actually invented it. Um, one question that comes up sometimes is can you deposit a sample? Um, so let's say I'm not sure exactly how to make um, or use a substance. Can I deposit a sample um, to, to help uh, with my disclosure? Uh, and the Federal Circuit has held that yes, depositing a sample um, uh, does add to your disclosure. Um, now, it, it doesn't automatically mean that you're going to satisfy the written description requirement. What they say is you have to you know, link the material that you've deposited in a public access uh, place um, to you know, the specific functions and, and techniques that you're talking about in your patent application in order to make it uh, work. But, um, but in general, depositing a sample can be a way um, of uh, enhancing your disclosure beyond uh, the written word. So as a requirement, let's talk about this now that we've gone through what the, the, the actual test is. So a few questions here, right? Is the requirement prove possession of the invention, is it useful? Right? I mean, is this, is this doing a lot of work for us? Uh, and I think it goes back to, to what you think about um, uh, how important it is to try and curtail inventors' uh, abilities to claim more broadly. Uh, you know, is it truly separable than enablement? And it clearly is um, the way that the court has articulated it. Um, uh, you will note a, a, s a small interchange in the Ariad case between uh, Judge Lurie, who wrote that opinion, and the, uh, and the counsel. Um, uh, where the council described um, uh, written description as super enablement or enablement plus, and Judge Lurie took exception to that, said that it is not simply enablement plus. It is a distinct and different creature. It is a different kind of test, and the test is, is about whether you've actually invented something. Um, and so in that sense, it does seem like um, uh, as a matter of jurisprudence, it is distinct from the written description requirement. It is not merely an enhanced version of written description. There's something different about it. Now, um, what I think is important to understand is that most of the time, most of the time, the written description requirement and enablement will rise and fall together, right? I mean, this is, in, in most cases, um, it will, uh, you will reach the same result in, in both uh, cases. If you're not enabled, you almost certainly have not offered a written description requirement. If you have offered, if you have enabled, most of the time, um, your written description requirement is going to be there. 
the, the question is you need to be careful here and make sure that you've done that little bit extra to, to convince a person of skill in the art that this is, uh, that is something you actually invented at the, at the relevant time. Um, so how will this impact patenting behavior? I mean, one of the things that was uh, debated in the Ariad case and has been debated in, in the academic literature is, you know, does this have an impact on um, patenting institutions such as universities? And, and a question to ask yourself is, how would it affect patenting behavior? I mean, does it encourage people to patent earlier? Uh, does it encourage people to patent later? Um, if it does either of those things, does it encourage people to disclose more, disclose less, work on certain kinds of technologies versus other kinds of technologies? Um, it's, I think, worth thinking about you know, how these legal rules um, can tailor uh, and incentivize different kinds of patenting behavior. Um, the universities have taken a very strong position over the years um, that they think that a strong written description requirement uh, is particularly uh, difficult for them to comply with. Uh, and so a question for, um, uh, for you uh, as the listener and the reader is to consider why that's the case and whether or not that's really um, a, a significant concern. All right, let's move on to the best mode requirement now, um, uh, which is a fairly straightforward uh, requirement, although somewhat interesting. Um, all right, so back again to our list of standards of patentability. Um, we are again dealing with section 112 disclosure, um, and best mode requirement is found at the end of section 112 paragraph 1, shall set forth the best mode contemplated by the inventor of carrying out his invention. All right. So. Uh, so let's consider first the policy of the, the best mode requirement. Why have a best mode requirement? The, the general articulation of this is that the best mode requirement prevents patentees from, um, uh, in a sense, uh, getting more than they deserve by patenting their invention and yet withholding some aspect of their invention which turns out to be important for its commercial or other success um, uh, and thereby get the benefits of both patent protection and uh, potentially some trade secrecy as well. So it's, it's intended to enforce you know, this deal, right? The deal here being that if you're going to get a patent and get the patent rights, you are going to give up and disclose everything you know about your invention. Um, and the, the best mode requirement by saying you have to tell us the best mode, the, the best way you think of carrying out your invention, um, enforces that requirement. Right? So uh, one thing I want to note at the outset is the American Events Act, which took uh, effect last September, um, changed language in Section 282, which is, uh, deals with the defenses to patent infringement, and removed best mode as a defense, uh, as an invalidity defense to patent infringement. What that means is you, in court, you can no longer raise noncompliance with the best mode as a defense to patent infringement. Right. Why did Congress do this? Well, uh, one of the issues with best mode is, is as we'll see, there's a, is a, a very subjective component to it, um, uh, which means it was subject to enormous amounts of litigation and very few cases of where you where you people felt comfortable that somebody had actually violated the best mode. So um, the view was that although it enforced some sort of important relationship, uh, the amount of litigation and disputing uh, and discovery work and that sort of thing that it created was probably not worth it. And so Congress made the judgment that we were going to remove um, best mode as a uh, defense to infringement. Now, best mode remains as a patentability requirement. Uh, which means that at least in theory, the PTO uh, could um, reject a patent application uh, on the basis of failure to describe a best mode. Um, but uh, I'll leave it to you to consider whether this seems likely um, uh, for a bunch of, of reasons. So think about whether that's a likely impact or a likely scenario or not. So I'll get to the, the black letter law on best mode requirement, which is relatively straightforward. Um, it is a two component uh, requirement. One is a subjective component. The first question that you ask in dealing with the best mode is, did the inventor have a best mode of making the invention? And then if number one is true, uh, this, the, the question is whether or not the disclosure is sufficient uh, to describe the best mode. 
And uh, you might imagine uh, that the standard for uh, disclosure quality uh, is the same as we've heard before. Would a person of ordinary skill in the art, um, uh, through the disclosure, understand the inventor's best mode? Right. That's so. That's the analysis. It's got a subjective component. The first question asked is, did the inventor have a uh, a best mode? If the inventor had a best mode, is that best mode disclosed sufficiently for a person of skill in the art to understand it? So the Young Dental case deals with uh, dental profies, um, and uh, and uh, so the the claims here uh, was a disposable dental profi angle. Um, uh, and uh, what this, and it was made of plastic. It had particular gear ratios um, uh, involved in it. The, the product that was actually sold, um, uh, and it, it appeared that the patentee um, uh, uh, had a particular kind of plastic uh, that was um, uh, his or her uh, preferred type of plastic to make this thing out of. Uh, and indeed had specific gear ratios in the gearing mechanism uh, that he or she had in mind that, that, that was thought, were thought to be particularly uh, well adapted for most um, uses of the dental profi angle. The district court held uh, that this then violated the best mode because the court said, the district court said, um, this inventor clearly had information uh, relating to the best way to make and use this invention, uh, and it was withheld. All right? the, the Federal Circuit reverses this and says that that is not true. It is not, in fact, a violation of the best mode to, failure, to, to fail to disclose the gear ratios uh, or the type of plastic in this case. Um, and the reason the court says that um, uh, is that it doesn't think um, that those particular uh, facts, those particular um, uh, modes are really what the invention is about. Right? And so that raises what I think is the, the important limitation on the scope of the best mode. Right? The first is um, you, you need not disclose a best mode when the mode is unrelated to the quality or the nature of the invention. Right? If, if I disclose, a, a, um, you know, a, for example, a, a mouth guard that you uh, boil in water to heat up and then you put in your mouth, Right, uh, that's my invention. Um, do I need to disclose to you um, uh, the uh, the specific amount of water that I use um, uh, when I am, uh, you know, cooking my the mouth guard to make it work? And the answer there is is no. It's not the invention. The invention is the mouth guard. The invention is the operable pieces, whatever it is that I'm claiming. And so that's why you got to start in the best mode with the claim and figure out what the inventor actually claimed and then try to figure out from there how that goes back and relates to um, uh, the, the, uh, whether or not there's a, a best mode, whether the inventor had a best way of doing things. All right. So the example here are production details. Right. So I don't have to tell you how to boil water. Right, I, that's a production detail. Uh, I don't have to tell you how much water I use. I don't have to tell you what color the pan was. I don't have to tell you uh, because that's not part of my invention. My invention is the mouth guard. It's not. It's not the water. It's not the boiling. It's not the the pan. Uh, so I only have to uh, tell you things that are related to the quality or nature of the invention. Second, an inventor need not disclose information that's within uh, the scope of ordinary skill in the art. Right, so if the uh, person having ordinary skill in the art would already know these things, right? If you understand how to heat plastic and put it in a mold, I don't have to disclose that again. That is routine details. That's uh, not something that that I need to disclose because uh, even though I might have had a preferred way of doing it, if everybody knows that preferred way of doing it, there's nothing that I didn't disclose because a person of ordinary skill in the art already knows that. Right. So why would we limit the requirement this way? Well, I, mean, I think the easiest answer is we don't want patent applications to become, you know, encyclopedias. Right? These are these are documents intended to advance skill in the art, not to teach everything uh, that that science knows about a particular topic. And so, although we say that you have to disclose, the amount you have to disclose is really only that that's uh, greater than what is already known by a person having ordinary skill in the art. And so this is consistent 
uh, with, for example, the enablement requirement, uh, where uh, enablement, you only have to enable what a person of ordinary skill in the art wouldn't otherwise know. Uh, and here, you only have to offer best mode uh, uh, disclosure um, in the event that a, a person of ordinary skill in the art would not be able to understand your best mode. Right. So sometimes the best mode can be best understood through a few hypos. Uh, you select a mode by chance or convenience. Do you have to disclose that mode in your patent application? The answer here is no. Right. You've selected a mode, but there's no information there that you thought it was the best mode. Right? So if you're just simply picking up a tool off your workbench or a material that was easily at hand, and you didn't have a best. Right? Remember this subjective requirement. Is it the best way of doing the invention? Not necessarily. It's just the way that you did it. Uh, and so therefore, you don't have to disclose that. Right? Um, uh, so that's, that is a mode you don't have to disclose. You select a mode because it makes your invention easier or cheaper to produce. Do you have to disclose that mode? The answer here is again no, unless, unless the invention itself has to do with being easier and cheaper to produce, right? So if your claim language has something to do with being easier or cheap to produce, then yes, you do have to disclose that mode. Otherwise, these are production details, right? The fact that you're using a certain kind of plastic because it flows better into a mold, if you're not claiming the plastic, uh, then that is that is something you don't necessarily you don't have to disclose uh, as a best mode. Now, as a practical matter, most people will disclose these things, right? There's there's not a lot of reason not to, if indeed they're not particularly uh, trade secrets. Um, and the downside of not disclosing means that someone could come back at you later, although not after the American Vents Act, but you could have potential trouble, I guess, uh, with the PTO if you didn't disclose. In general, err on the side of disclosure, but here, um, unless you're claiming something easier and cheaper to produce, you probably don't have to disclose that mode. What about you mistakenly inadver or inadvertently to fail to disclose the best mode? Do you have a problem? Yes, your patent is invalid here, right? It doesn't matter. There doesn't have to be a intent to deceive. That's not the standard. The standard is, did you have a best mode? Is that best mode disclosed? Those are the two components. There's no knowledge requirement. There's no intent requirement. It's simply, did you have one? Was it disclosed? Um, here, you're, you're going to have a problem. Um, you work on a corporate research team. Uh, a non-inventor colleague, right, somebody who's unrelated to the invention, uh, when you're talking to them over lunch, perhaps, uh, or comes up with a better mode than you do and tells you before the filing date, must you disclose this mode? Well, the question here is, did you think it was the best? Right? And what matters is you, not what your colleague uh, thinks. Right? So the, the question to be asked here is, did you, uh, having been told this mode by your colleague, um, understand uh, that it was the best mode. If you didn't, then no, you don't have to disclose it. Right? If you didn't think it was the best mode, then no. If you did, then yes, you do have to disclose that. And the question is whether you, the inventor, has have a best mode. Right? A non-inventor uh, colleague determines a better mode than you do, but does not tell you before the filing date. Uh, and in general, the the um, law here is that you don't have to update your best mode. Right? It's all measured as of the filing date. So even if you determine a better mode later, uh, you don't have to, unless you refile your application for some reason, you don't have to uh, disclose the mode. And then finally, the non-inventor colleague determines a better mode than you do, but doesn't tell you before the filing date. She tells upper management, right? So somebody not involved in the invention, but maybe your boss, right? And again, the question is, does the inventor have a best mode, right? It doesn't matter what senior management thinks. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. It matters what the inventor thinks. So um, this particular rule um, has been criticized. Uh, this particular fact scenario has been criticized because it might encourage companies to, um, you know, corporate and to make. Uh, Componentize their research teams. Have somebody working on the basic invention, somebody working on the application of the invention, somebody working on another aspect of the invention, and keep them apart so that the best mode doesn't have to be disclosed of any one part. Um, that's a possibility. Although now, of course, uh, now that best mode can't be used in litigation, I think that's uh, less concern.